And we're recording, so yes, welcome to another particularly, if I may say, exciting episode of the Good Listening To podcast with me, Chris Grimes, because you might see the clues in the title if you're watching the film version of this. I'm delighted to welcome to the Good Listening To, or GLT Clearing, Mr. Colin Grimes. Now, the clues in the title there, otherwise known as My Father. So, <laughs> Colin Grimes, welcome to the Clearing. How are you today? I'm particularly good today. Thank you very much. I'm having a good day. Wonderful to have you here as well. And so um, what I'm going to do, it, it, rather fascinatingly, is I'm going to take you through the normal route map of the Good Listening To podcast, where we're going to talk about a clearing, what that represents to you. We're then going to shake your tree to see which apples fall out. We'll talk about alchemy and gold, and then we'll bathe in the sort of stories that you've learned, the life lessons that you've learned along the way. And then as with everyone else, I'll give you a cake at the end of it where we'll put a cherry on the cake. And we might get slightly more profound in the idea of the legacy of the conversation, which we'll come on to uh, later on. So uh, just to position as to why I wanted to talk to you particularly, um, one of the things that always, I suppose, fascinated and intrigued me was your ability to be a 1960s trailblazer because the stunning thing is at my age equivalent of 28 and I'm 58 now in the mid 60s you did something incredibly brave which allows me to talk about one of the most interesting parts of my biography in that you at my age equivalent emigrated to Uganda at the age of 28 with three kids under the age of eight I was trying to do the maths on that and that was an incredibly trailblazing and pioneering thing to do in the mid 60s, escaping North Ormsby and Middlesbrough to go to Uganda, which now allows me to say, hey, I grew up in Uganda till I was nearly 10 years old. So I'm, I'm hoping and probably sure we might talk about that in part two. But okay. that's just to position you. Yeah. Uh, but first of all, um, let's just ask you, what is a clearing like for you, Dad, a.k.a. Colin Grimes? Well, strangely enough, uh, looking at your briefing, this is one of the most difficult things I've found to find an answer to. I, I think I honestly say I don't need a clearing in the, the, the sort of accepted sense of the word. I find that whatever environment I'm in, if I, there's some sort of deep thought or, or um, ideas to be generated, I can switch off quite automatically from whatever's going on around me and just be uh, almost self-sufficient and, and, and make my own clearing or isolation uh, and and uh, work within the environment I happen to be in at the present time. I don't need to sort of go to bed or go into a darkened room or find a favourite chair or anything. I, uh, I'm able to switch on into a, a reflective mood anytime I, I, I choose to. So it sounds to me like it's sort of an internal switch within your own mindscape that you can go yeah. into to just shift right. focus. Yeah, yeah. And before we spoke, I fully expected it might be something like a bowling green or, or, or your happy place where you go to be at your most happiest. Well, I, I find happiness in all sorts of places. I mean, ideally, once a year, a great happiness is off to Madeira and, uh, and having four and five weeks in such wonderful surroundings there. But I don't use that time to be particularly reflective. I just bask and enjoy the, uh, uh, the pleasures as, as they come. You know, I... Uh, uh, Towards New Year's Eve, I suppose one gets more reflective every year. But uh, apart from that, no, um, I enjoy my bowling. I enjoy being in Madeira. I enjoy being at home. I enjoy doing my crossroads every day. But when it comes to the sort of thing that you're looking for, you know, sort of reflective and intellectual development or, or reviewing one's situation in life, or, or even as we probably get on to now, beginning to think of one's legacy, it's not something that I have to find a particular place to, to do. I can be creative wherever I am. So there's a lovely thread or through line there, a golden thread of your ability to be truly present in whatever's in front of you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's the way it works. Lovely. So in terms of life lessons and reflections, we're going to get on to that uh, next. Mm -hmm. So um, we're going to now uh, bring a tree metaphorically into your clearing, which is rather comically, I'm going to try and bring a tree into your head. Mm -hmm. And um, we're going to shake your tree to see which apples fall out. And you two have done the prep that I've asked everybody else to do so far. We've had five minutes, uh, Colin Grimes, a.k.a. Dad, to think about four things that have shaped you, mm -hmm. three things that inspire you. Uh, two things that never fail to grab your attention and then one quirky or unusual fact about you 
that we couldn't possibly know until you tell us. Uh, you don't have to download all apples simultaneously. You can go wherever you want. So um, over to you. How do you like them apples? Let's talk about the four things that have shaped you. The four things that have shaped me. Um, I think undoubtedly one has to say family uh, generally and wife in particular. Uh, as you're aware, we've been married now for 63 years. We've known each other since our very early uh, teenage years. And inevitably over those 63 years, we've grown and developed together. And uh, I think mom has had a tremendous influence on the way in which she's uh, reined back some of my excesses and at the same time given me the support and the, uh, the room and the air to develop in those areas where we've mutually felt it is beneficial for our, uh, our family and our general lives. And when uh, you so, first... Sorry, carry on. And when you first met, I know there is a family story about you being in baggy scout shorts up yeah, a tree okay. and yeah. your mum's ironically up a tree there uh, so mummy had a look at your apples at an early age <laughs> <laughs> uh, so it's in the and Middlesbrough where obviously we're from but you're from specifically that's right yeah yeah and I, I think that you know one of the questions you uh, I, I, I think you are you know, wanting to know who am I what, how would I define myself I think we, we have to start with North Ormsby, which is probably anybody who's listening is hardly likely to know. It is a pretty down market, borderline slum area, but is um, or was at that time a dormitory town for the iron and steel industry and all of the uh, uh, associated and peripheral activities like steel fabrication, shipbuilding, coal mining, chemical works and so on. So. Who am I? I see myself now looking back as, uh, if you like, a success of the social mobility move. Um, there's no doubt about it, whichever way you look at it, we have moved upwardly, if you like, um, very significantly from those early, uh, early days. And I look back with great pride on what we've managed to achieve from such humble beginnings. And you talked about this, the, the social mobility factor there. Obviously, my grandfather, your dad, worked in the steelworks that you mentioned there. Indeed, uh, uh, and in a very lowly, labouring, unskilled capacity. Uh, he worked very hard. He was a product of the Depression in the 20s, where uh, he was out of work and having to really walk around and offer himself try and find work whenever he could and there are stories of him you know walking in winter with paper stuffed into his boots because he had no uh, you know, no uh, solid shoe wear no no footwear no shoes etc and he, he obviously and and the families generally had a very hard life but then and, in, and indeed there it, sorry to interrupt you there, therein lies that uh, that's where that story comes from about when I were a lad I walked 20 miles through bare feet in snow that's where that comes from <laughs> right, yeah that's right yeah at least you know you had shoes to be yeah. I did life and stuff you know yeah but then you know, I was very lucky if you like I don't know where it came from because both uh, in family terms and in local community terms I was one of the very, very few, first of all, to pass the 11 plus examination as it was then, uh, and then subsequently to go on to university. Nobody, absolutely nobody in the immediate area in which we love, lived uh, had ever gone to university before. Uh, and so through that route, through the education route, I was able to take the first steps in this social mobility that uh, we've been talking about. And, and that indeed, it's that sort of trailblazing instinct, I suppose, which then I, it, it's nothing short of a very brave decision to escape that environment and then go as far afield as Uganda. It's very far flung yeah. as a solution yeah. to that. Uh, putting again, trying to put in that, that into some sort of perspective, having found myself on this trajectory where sadly, in many ways, I was. I won't say obliged or forced, but I found myself in the situation where my immediate family ties were loosening because there was no way in which my parents and the, the wider family could relate to the university experience, let alone the grammar school experience. I found myself drifting further and further away from immediate family ties. I, at grammar school, 
conversely, that was not a particularly pleasant experience because I came from the wrong side of the tracks and I was very seriously bullied throughout the whole seven years that I was at the school. So when I then eventually went on to university, it was totally transformative because I suddenly found myself top of the pops, if you like. For some reason, I was immediately amongst the most popular and the most well-received and well-accepted people uh, in, in the peer group in which I found myself. And that led me into being active within the, uh, the social life of the university. I was elected, first of all, believe it or not, as head barman for the organization. <laughs> then I became secretary of the social committee. Then I became chairman of the social committee. Uh, and that meant sort of vice presidency of the union, of the students' union. And, and this then, was Keele University, wasn't it? Keele University. Yeah. And the cherry on the cake was that I was then invited to host Princess Margaret as the president of the university and was chairman of the Royal Ball Committee. And, Marvellous. Uh, the social and, mobility uh, right there. Absolute. Yeah. And I suddenly then from the uh, rather feelings of, of, of sort of uh, uncertainty and insecurity from grammar school suddenly had this very secure and warm feeling that I perhaps had something to offer and I was perhaps um, uh, yeah, I say a better person, but uh, I, I was more um, acceptable socially and capable of engaging with people at the highest levels of society perfectly well. So that was the next uh, big influence uh, on my life. Then having gone into, from, from university, gone into teaching, and again, I found myself involved, not just in the teaching, but in many extracurricular activities. Um, I was running, uh, I was secretary of the staff association at the college, both colleges, which uh, I was at Longlands College of Further Education and uh, Cleveland Technical College. Um, and again, uh, and this I is pre-Uganda, this is your first part of your teaching career, wasn't it? The first part of the teaching yeah. career. And then um, the opportunity to go to Uganda arose and I had, no, I had very, very low expectations of being accepted. Mm -hmm. And I put in a speculative application one very cold, wintry November day. Again, at mum's suggestion, it was her prodding that uh, led me to do this. I put in a speculative application and lo and behold, six months later in the following April, off we went and that was it. No idea what to expect. We had had some preparatory work by going to a civil service college down in Farnham Castle. Mm -hmm. uh, where we were given a, a week's residential course on what to expect. But at that time, I'd been told that I was going up into the semi-desert northern area of Uganda. But three weeks before we were due to go, I got a letter from the headmistress of that school saying, sorry, we couldn't because the house wasn't ready. And I found myself switched to the wonderful southern area, lush uh, part of, of Uganda down in, in Ginger. So even all the preparatory work we had done was more or less wasted because we found ourselves in a totally different environment from that that we'd been led to expect. And there's a lovely thing about windows of opportunity there and there's a quote that I have struck on of late which is what's meant for you won't pass you by and so there are windows of opportunity on quite a lubricated hinge there mm -hmm. um, where you you answered the ad and then you ended up somewhere different but you went with the winds of, of being present to what was there and you 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 landed in the right place at the right time doing the right thing I'm assuming. In how you felt. Uh, I have no regrets whatsoever because once again within the mixed expatriate community we were dealing with people at United Nations level right down to um, the, the, you know, the, um, uh, the, the local Africans and the, uh, uh, the society in which we operated and uh, I very soon was able to uh, cultivate very close relationships with all levels of society etc and again the, the Evidence for that is I was once again elected as chairman of clubs, chairman of various committees. I held the very difficult position of expatriate representative on the government housing committee. Now that led me, or that gave me responsibility for 
finding suitable housing for all expatriates that were coming out to work in, in Uganda at mm -hmm. the same time as people from the, the locals, from the army and from the police and from the civil service were fighting for, or not fighting for, but were uh, in competition for the same limited housing stock. And that really taught one the art of diplomacy on how, without being described or, or without threat of being regarded as a racialist, yeah. managing to get the best deal possible for what was the uh, the white and therefore expatriate population over the local population who had equally strong grounds for wanting uh, good housing. So that was a very interesting experience. And there is a recurring theme all your life about you finding yourself in the pivotal position within committees. You know, you've been, we'll get onto this, I'm sure, but you've been, you're a sort of lifelong fixer. If you want something done properly, ask Colin Absolutely. Grimes. And that, no doubt about it. I'm an inveterate committee man. I can't think of any time since the age of 16 that I've not been involved in one committee or another of some kind. I've yeah. been on committees and on uh, uh, such groups for my entire life. I still am. Even it, at the it, ripe old age of 83, yeah. I still sit on four different committees and, and do what little I can on a voluntary basis. I just love it. So if you want something done properly, get Colin Grimes involved, he'll fix it. So there's something there <laughs> about the thread of that. In that sense, yeah. But th there is one influence, so if we're talking still about influences, one influence in my life I cannot underestimate. And that takes us back to the days when I was uh, in my very young, sort of 12 to 18, my grammar school days. Mum and I were very, very active in the church. Oh, uh, by the way, j just before we move away from that, I, um, in, in the, a few paragraphs ago, I didn't know that you'd been sort of serially bullied for the seven years at grammar school. That's very interesting that I've not heard that before or not tuned really, into that. Really? Uh -huh. Yeah, but a, fa a fact of life, uh, it was just one of these things that, uh, you know, Grimes came from, uh, you know, from his father was a labourer. Um, he came from the wrong side of the tracks and therefore you know, was, was to be singled out immediately as someone different. Uh, and whether or not there was an element, you know, who, who can explain why bullying takes place? I don't mm -hmm. know. Um, all I could do, and by way of response, is just get my head down and work like mad and make sure that I got the results academically that the, uh, the grammar school um, opportunity presented to me. So that's exactly what I did. And it positions and my, you to be very sort of adaptable and flexible in your life. And you started off as an outlier within your own home environment or school environment. Totally. And then the more you've gone out into the big wide world, you've constantly found demographics of I suppose, exactly. upward ascension. That's exactly it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But and sorry, uh, I interrupt as, you. I was, as I was saying, there's one influence, one strong influence I can't ignore. And that's the, the local vicar, uh, Reverend Nicholas Breen, he was called. Mum and I, as I said, were active in the church, so much so, I was running the scout group, Mum and I were running the local youth club, we were running the Sunday school, uh, and we had a nice sort of social group, uh, uh, all of, of like-minded people, uh, youngsters like ourselves, and we were very immersed in the church. Uh, and I used to be the uh, I used to be a server and le read the lessons and even sing the offices sometime at, at, at Evensong and some of those services. Now, the vicar took me under his wing in describing the relationship in modern terms, there would be alarm bells ringing like mad because he used to invite me up to his vicarage and he used to invite me to sit with him and do my homework. He used to read, ask me to read out my English essays and, and we would discuss them. He made his library available to me. He used to give me half a crown now and again as extra pocket money to enable me to do things I didn't want to. He would also take me on holiday with him, Crikey. providing I was wearing my scout uniform. Now, you can see where all the alarm bells and modern society begin, but there was absolutely no suggestion or hint of any kind that there was anything by way of what we call today grooming going on. Yeah other than he was grooming me for a higher purpose. And it was completely um, 
uh, altruistic as far as he was concerned. He took as much pride in my development as, in fact, more pride in it than, than my parents probably did, because he was able to relate to what I was going through far more than, than they did. So he had a sort of vicarious enjoyment intent of your further development. Exactly. So it was a genuine yeah. integrity field intent to help and nurture a fellow human being. Absolutely. And I wasn't alone. We, we were a group of perhaps eight or nine, I think, from memory, uh, that uh, we, we used to be together, the Servers Guild, as it were. I was the one uh, in a series um, over the three or four years that I'm talking about when I was the sort of head server and we were going on holiday together. Yeah. Um, I was the only one going on holiday with him. And it, you know, I'd come to the top of, uh, of the pile, if you like. Yeah. Um, but we were, he had done the similar thing with others before me and continued to do the same sort of thing after me. But um, he, the main thing that he gave me was, was this inspiration to work hard and to develop what intellectual skills I had and to, uh, to sort of uh, support and stimulate uh, my, my thinking and my, my learning ability, etc. Uh, and did you keep in touch that with... Carried did you keep... me through those very difficult years uh, a great deal. So did you return to keeping in touch with him often as, as life went on? No, um, we stayed in touch. I mean, he married mum and I, he married us um, in, in the church. Um, then when I went off to university, um, I, I had a sort of transition. Um, at Keel, there was a foundation year to be done. It was a four-year course, and you had to study subjects that you'd not studied at, you know, at uh, A-level. Now, my A-levels were English, French, and British Constitution. Um, I decided, amongst many other things at Keel, to study historical theology. <laughs> and unfortunately, in studying the historical the uh, part of, of theology, my faith received a tremendous knocking, and I'm afraid I, it, it, it's just, it just sort of removed any residual faith that I might have had. And since then, I've been you know, increasingly so uh, atheistic and uh, uh, a complete unbeliever, if you uh -huh. think in, in those terms. Yes. So um, we lost direct touch. We stopped corresponding with each other. And then very shortly after uh, my first year at university, he simply disappeared from the scene. Um, I've tried for a little, many, many occasions to find out if there was anything untoward mm -hmm. in that background, but have been able to do so. Um, I've not been able to find out what happened to him. My parents, who uh, at that time, we were working at ver as vergers in the church, helping caretakers, helping to keep the church clean, and uh, my mother doing the job that I had done, writing out marriage bans and, and taking record of parish records. Uh, they were not able to give me any explanation either, but uh, sadly, he just disappeared entirely from my life and from the parish of Nathonsby. So he remains an enigma, a force in your life, and are we saying he's someone that shaped you or he's an influencer or both? Both. Yeah. Both. Yeah. And just say his name once again. I know it's Breen. Nicholas Breen. Breen. B R E N E. He was actually a Southern Irish Protestant, which again is something very, you know, very strange at the time. That uh, there he was, a lovely Southern Irish brogue, but he was Protestant rather than, than Roman Catholic. And his reputation. So his reputation yeah. in your heart remains true to this day that there was nothing oh, absolutely yeah nothing at all non altru well it, it was an altruistic intent mm, yeah Beautiful. absolutely yeah so there you have you have you know influences is is wife and family um the uh, university uganda and and the uh, nicholas breen those i think are the four definitely life enhancing and life shaping experiences that uh, have brought me to where I am to be today. Wonderful. Okay, so now uh, we're, we're overlapping slightly in terms of the, the things that influence you as well, but let's get, move away from four things that have shaped you to three things that inspire you now. Mm, again, um, pretty difficult. I think there are I think I have to recognize that I'm, I'm a, as well as being an inveterate committee man, 
and, and perhaps that might ex it might explain why I'm an inveterate committee man, is I think I'm also a born teacher. Nothing inspires me more than seeing an opportunity to participate in it, participate in a way which improves things. You know, in whatever I've been doing professionally, I've never been satisfied just to sit back and do the job. I've always looked around to gather around me people with similar uh, occupations, similar professions, and then generate a range of activities which either helps to improve performance or, uh, as it was in the latter stages of my career, recognition of what we were doing as a, an acceptable profession. So the opportunity to get in and do things to improve things is, is a great inspiration to me. You know, I, I just love nothing better than that. And, and I consider myself the DNA of the fact, you know, I teacher trained before I actor trained. And that was thanks to your very good parental advice when I was 19. If you want to be an actor, be a teacher first. And I've, I've thanked you for that because it's always come true. But also, as we know, your, your granddaughter, Lily, my daughter, is now training to become a primary school teacher. So there's mm -hmm. something about the desire to help and enable others um, and better them through our participation, which is definitely there as a thread. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing that I find great inspiration for is um, in all kinds of artistic expression, whether it be language, whether it be photography, whether it be uh, fine art, painting, drawing, uh, music, the whole range of artistic expression. I find myself greatly inspired by performance at the highest level in all of those areas. Uh, like yourself, I think you are developing along the same lines. I'm deeply interested and always have been in language. And I love nothing more than sitting and listening to people who are expressing themselves well and clearly. And um, it, it just gives me a great thrill and, and, and enables me then to aspire to keep my language skills going and, and, and become as eloquent as I, as I possibly can. So the art of communication is what you're interested in. Absolutely. By. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and, and then the, the, all of these have got to have some sort of output, if you like, and, and I'm always thrilled by observing the synergy that comes out of group activities. Yeah. You know, you, you can sit there and do as much original thinking as you like, but unless A, you can be persuasive on other people or B, you're, you're, you're seeing other people develop as a result of your thoughts and ideas, synergy uh, is, is a fantastic feeling, whether it's standing in front of a class, standing in front of an audience of 500, or just sitting in a committee of three or four of you, and together working on a problem and seeing this solution, if you like, or this, this development of whatever kind blossom, mm -hmm. is a fantastic feeling. Um, there's nothing like it. So you're a collaborator and a galvanizer of others, as the well, like committee so. member that you yes. are. And, and my record would tend to prove that, I think. Yeah. Unquestionably. Very good. So anything else you want to tell us about anything else that inspires you? No, I, I think that's pretty wide and it, it covers most things, I think. Yeah. An appreciation of high art, language, culture and all that shablang. That sort of thing, and, yeah. and now we're going to talk about uh, two things that never fail in the world of oh, squirrels uh, to get your attention. So in life, what, what always grabs your attention? Uh, uh. I think here we, we've got to have two. I, one, I think I've already mentioned by overlap, high quality artistic expression in whatever field. You know, I'm, I'm immediately grabbed by a piece of music or a piece of artwork or, or, or whatever. And that's on, you know, that gives you the good feeling. Unfortunately, as, as I get older, I find myself increasingly find things to annoy me. <laughs> <laughs> the old git society. Is the that old a... society. Um, so, I, I don't know, you're not literally the president of that, but I can relate to that in the irascible old age that I am. Uh, and, I, and I have to admit that there are many, many things in today's society that really do upset me. This woke business that we're all going through at the moment. And uh, the idea of, well, I mean, the work thing itself, it accepts something as, uh, as, as right one day and the following day it's totally wrong. 
getting to the point where people of my age of my tradition are becoming frightened to say things because we're not sure who we're going to upset next mm -hmm. by simple use of effective language as we would see it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm getting to the stage now where I hate to use the word black, for example, in any context. You know, we used to have a laugh and say, no, no, I can't, I'll take my coffee with milk, please. And that used to be a joke. Now you can't say anything like this without risking upsetting some people and being completely uh, shunned, isolated. I forget what, what's the modern Ostracized. word? Ostracised. Well, Ostracised. Ostracised, yes. But the, 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 there is a new word where thing going on at universities at the moment where they won't have speakers coming in because they're expressing an opinion which is contrary to what happens to be the fashion of the day. Yes. Uh, I forget that word. So it's sort of a, a terrain or a, a landscape of eggshells that uh, are very difficult Absolutely. to tread Absolutely. without crunching um, on somebody. Yeah. And uh, I, I'm hesitating now, as I say, it. one of the things that really, really upsets me is this business about gender assignment at the moment. Yeah. I mean, as far, I have a simple view of life. There are male and female. You know, God created them both going back to my former days, right? Any, that's the natural state of affairs. Anything else, by definition, therefore, is unnatural. <laughs> once I start following down that line, you can see where I go at the extremes of some of my thoughts, but yes. I don't intend to express them here. I can feel some crunching <laughs> happening. <laughs> oh, we're on eggshells. That's very good. Yeah. But so, so there's two things. One, I get I get really inspired by artistic expression of the highest quality, and I get really, really annoyed by the way in which modern and and longevity and experience therefore has also allowed for a bit of a binary perception, if you like, because it's either fits yeah. in with that frame or it's not within that frame. Yeah, exactly. So it's venom and anti venom as opposed to you know, problem solution, new way of thinking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, uh, you know put in those two camps uh, that's it as uh, uh, inspiration otherwise you know, I can't see where else inspiration comes from and I have to say when, when I asked you what what never fails to grab your attention I I did strongly suspect that this is where bowls would come in because I'm obsessed with ping pong as my ball of choice and now tennis um, uh, as in you and squirrels is where's dad he's at the bowling green so you must talk about that at some point but uh, you don't have to <laughs> talk about what Bowls, because, you know, you, you are, like I'm obsessed with ping pong, you're obsessed with bowls because you're the president of the club, Syston Bowls Club. You may or may not have been going to talk about that, but... Um, it just happens to be a pastime that I enjoy. And, as I said earlier in this conversation, having joined the club, and I'm a great believer, if you join a club, then you contribute. You don't just sit back and let others do the work. Then there was an opportunity to, I observed an opportunity to help and improve. This was aided by the fact that I was approached by the then committee to mm -hmm. come in and join them and help them uh, develop. So it's been an arena in which I've been able to prolong my active life by applying yes. those skills and talents that I've got to turning this very little insignificant club to one of the highest regarded in the county, both on and off the green, and one of the best managed clubs probably in the country. Right there. The COVID uh, pandemic, for example, that we're all living through at the moment, many bowling clubs in this area are on the verge of collapse because of their lack of structure and financial security. Sison Bowling Club is now sitting with nearly £30,000 in the bank mm -hmm. and very solid um, foundations and a good management team to look after them. And that, again, is a matter of pride. And it's something which you know, I can build a bit tick in that box of saw the opportunity to do it, tick, it's there. And just to be clear, well, it's not it's not held overnight in a safe within the Bowls Club. <laughs> <laughs> no. But then, you know, the, the, the converse then happens. One gets to the point where one is so highly valued or regarded that you get to the situation where anything that goes wrong within the club, it's, oh, ask Colin, he'll know. <laughs> and try as I might to then withdraw myself gradually, perhaps to do other things in other areas, 
it's just so damn difficult because the the reliance is there. So, if you like, it's a failure on my part, as not just to develop, but to actually complete the teaching and the education. It's a very slow and laborious process because you know, while there's one willing helper here, why the hell should anybody else volunteer to do it? And uh, and the, the comedian in me thinks that also the coach in me thinks that we should maybe talk to you about the art of delegation. But you know, <laughs> if you want something done properly, do it yourself. No, I'm an arch delegator. There's no, you know, I, I'm I sure can you delegate that no problem at all. But uh, no, it's. Uh, it's a bit restricting. The actual bowling itself uh, on the green during the summer months is outdoor exercise. And at our age, there's very little opportunity to uh, to get out and have physical exercise. Yep. It's just an opportunity which I grasp with both hands. And I've certainly missed it this year because I've been able to play maybe once or twice a week. That's all. And a couple of competitions mm -hmm. instead of being three or four times a week enjoying it. And uh, physically, uh, the effects are there. I've not mm -hmm. had as much exercise and I'm not one for, I mean, I've had a yoga mat, which I bought when I first retired, which still is in the wrapping I bought it in. <laughs> 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 yeah, I'm not one for following Mr. Motivator or whatever and doing your exercises for half an hour every day on the bathroom floor. I, I didn't think you were, Dad. That's, we, we're both, we can agree on that. That's good. Uh, 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 yeah. So moving away from the uh, two things that have, uh, we're now on to uh, a, a quirky or unusual fact about you, Colin Grimes, that we couldn't know unless you told us. Well, apparently, I've told you one already that I was, yeah, you know, I was the, the 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 object of bullying at school. But uh, I find it difficult because, as a family, I believe we've had a very open relationship, and we, you know, there's there's been nothing which has been taboo or that we haven't that we've had to keep back from each other. Um, I can only fall back on sort of say one of the biggest regrets of my life. And, and that will probably um, you know, come as a surprise, maybe, is my biggest regret is that I never learned to play the piano. OK. And I do envy, because going back to this artistic expression, etc. Mm. I now really do envy people who can just go to a piano and just tinkle out a few tunes, etc. Yes. And, uh, I really kick myself for not taking up or bowing to my parents' pressure when I was 10, 11, 12 years old mm -hmm. uh, to, to take piano lessons. And uh, had I, were I to have my time again, I think that would be probably fairly high on my list of priorities. Second, uh, followed very closely by private airline pilot. Okay. Uh, I, I would like to be up there in the sky in one of these light aircraft flying around the place. I'd, I'd love that as a freedom, but... Uh, whether they count as surprising facts, I don't know. But and you're you angling are. for a, angling for an 84th birthday present dual thing there, which is a, <laughs> an air license and a piano, but not at the That's same it. time. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so we've shaken your tree, and now we're yeah. going to move away from the tree, but stay in the clearing, which is, as we said, your ability to be truly present within your own head. And we've been implying this because you've been giving me alchemy and gold in what your purpose is. But in terms of alchemy and gold, what is it that Colin Grimes always knows that he's bringing and loves to bring? So how would you answer to alchemy and gold? I think the thing that I'm best known for is reliability. If Colin says he's going to do something, he does it. And you can rely upon it being done on time to the highest quality. Um, that's, and, and that would extend, I hope, I mean, I might be taking these things for granted. I hope in terms of parenting, that is also is and always has been the case. I'm always here, I'm always there, and always will be you know, to, to help and assist wherever I can. I can be relied upon to be supportive. Not blindly so, as I think you and Adrian both know, I do have my Awkward. criticism. <laughs> but um, I see no point in just being blindly supportive, but I can be relied upon for um, you know, whatever is necessary at the time.
Yes, and in fact, I, I did get the blunt end of... I rang you up once to show you the first episode of the Good Listening To podcast, and you told me not once but thrice how irritating you find the use of my hands whilst I'm doing this. <laughs> I'm, glad, I'm glad to see you've taken that into consideration. Yes, jazz hands, they've calmed down slightly. I'm sort of clamping them there just in case yeah, Colin nice. Grimes takes offence. Very good. Yeah. Um, so now we're, gonna, we're coming up to the point where I got quite intrigued in the slightly new thrust of what we're doing now in the Seven Ages of Man and the Jaquies speech from... Um, as you like it, which is all the world's a stage and every man and woman has their entrances and their exits. So in awarding you with a cake, um, I'm just going to ask you to put a cherry on the cake. In the, the legacy of the conversation that we've had, um, you can interpret it how you want. I'd like to hear what your favourite inspirational quote has been that's given you sucker. Can you give us that first? Come on. Probably the rather um, uh, trite and uh, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. Three or four times in my life, I faced very serious challenges and I've never buckled under any of them. I've, I think, taken that quote of well, OK, the going's tough, but let's get going and do something about it. Uh, so I think, although it's a bit cliched, I'd probably have that fairly high up in my list of, uh, of quotes. And in, in Shakespearean or highfalutin, but just... Yeah. And in the cliched, sort of... But important. And in the instinct of giving you a damn good listening to, is there anything else you want to tell me about any of those aspects that are really trialling to you? That were trialling? Yes. Uh well, top of the list, obviously, is the loss of your sister. Um, I mean, the death of Hazel was a fantastic um, uh, occurrence, one that, um, you know, no one should ever have to go through. And that was a particularly trying time from all points of view, you know, mm -hmm. professional, personal, family-wise, and all the rest of it. That would have to be at the top of the tree. But... Um, I mean, twice in fairly rapid order in the uh, late 70s, early 80s, um, I found myself unemployed for what I regarded as no particular reason of my own, uh, of my own doing. Uh, and again, at that late stage in life where uh, jobs were not the easiest to come by uh, for people of the age I was at the time, um, I believe that uh, that when the going gets tough, the tough get going kicked in. And I, I think clearly, if you look back at my record, very successfully addressed those and overcame them to the point where it was almost as though um, I could say that I was, I had to go through those experiences because there was something greater to come out of it at the end of it. And I finished up having for 18 years, formed a company and run my own company, which was highly successful uh, and, and, is, and persists to this day. I was able to secure the jobs for, uh, in my day, eight or nine people. It's now employing 15 or 16 people and it's still going strong. So, um, you know, I think my record on that side of things um, stands for itself and I'm, I'm very proud of what I achieved. And with that philosophy of innate optimism and the, the future focus and the action towards, you know, oh, the, yeah. as you say, the, the dark shadow of the family is obviously the death of Hazel. Um, yeah. And how have you come to peace with that? Or maybe you haven't. You, 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 it, it's tried to say you never do uh, come. You, you have to accept it. It is a fact of life. Mm -hmm. But the... Every experience in life, every new experience, every phase, every stage you go through, there is always coming to the fore, if only, if only. And everything one does, every new experience one has, there is a, no matter how, how slight, there is a, 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 a colouring of, of, of thought and regret and, and, mm. and the idea of a wasted life, etc., and a wasted opportunity and, and all the rest of it. So... Uh, you come to terms with it by just accepting it as a fact, yes. but uh, 
there is no way you can explain it, if you put it that way, in yeah. terms of uh, you know, our, our friend over in Spain, Gillian, will say, you know, there was God had a reason for it to happen. Well, that to me is absolute crap and you know, it would never, ever come anywhere near my thought. You, you can't explain it, but you just have to accept it and, and swallow hard and, and, and get through these things. And indeed, you know, my own admiration for, you know, what's happened within the family, it was su such a tectonic and seismic shift to our experience as a family that, you you know, you don't wish upon anyone. But as you say, it is a fact of life. Life and death are facts. And yeah. that, that yeah. sense of optimism and pragmatism have been, you know, mm -hmm. set you in very good stead, I think. I think so. I mean, you, you mentioned the word optimist there. My mum calls me her cockeyed optimist because whatever she comes up with with dark thoughts and she tends to come up with them far more regularly than <laughs> I do. <laughs> um, I, I always seem to be able to find an answer to put a smile on her face and, and, and get her through the next 24 hours until she has the next dark thought. <laughs> so I, I, yeah, I am. I'm a born optimist. Lovely. And going back to the seven ages of man and the Jaquies, all the world's a stage. Um, just to get it slightly more profound now, uh, we'll talk about um, legacy. Um, Colin Grimes, how do you think you'd most like to be remembered? Hmm. <laughs> I'd like to be remembered as the guy that made a difference. I'd, yeah, if, if I think you mentioned where in an earlier conversation who... You know, looking at this, what would you like to see on your tombstone sort of thing? Yeah. Um, yeah. He left us in a better place than we were before we started sort of thing. I'd, I'd, I'd like to think that in, in all aspects of, of life, whether that starts with, with family or profession or, or personal or whatever it, you know, I'd like to think I'm, I'm recognized for making things better. Colin Grimes, the guy who made a difference. Thank you very much indeed for joining me, uh, aka your son, Chris Grimes, here on the Good Listening To podcast. Thank you very much indeed. Good night. It's been my great pleasure. Good night. See you later.